I uh, am pleased to announce our last speaker today is Alistair Ross who's going to speak on research validation and quality assurance in Australia. I'd like to thank him for traveling to come to see us today. He is the director of the National Institute of Forensic Sciences, and he was recognized as a member of the Order of Australia for his services to forensic sciences. He was also elected chair of the Board National Association of Testing Authorities in Australia. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Alistair Ross. Uh, thank you very much to President Logan, to Sue Ballou, and also to Laura Liptai. Uh, thank you for the invitation to address the Academy. Um, it is uh, an honour and a privilege for me to be here. Um, five years ago, uh, when the NAS report was released, um, it was not only a wake-up call for forensic science in the United States, but it was a wake-up call for forensic science globally. Um, and I think it was a report that, as a forensic science community, um, we ignored our peril. And we certainly created a lot of interest in, in, in Australia. Uh, it was read widely. Uh, and I want to talk today... Uh, about a number of things, I guess. Uh, as an introduction to talk about uh, my institution, um, ANSPA, NIFS, National Institute of Forensic Science. I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in terms of quality systems in Australia. I want to talk about what we're doing with respect to innovation, research and development. And then I want to go on to address uh, some of the themes for this plenary session about challenging and transforming our thinking. Uh, because I think if we're going to truly address um, all of the issues raised in the NAS report, then there has to be some challenges and, uh, and reinforcing uh, the thinking that, that we do. Uh, the National Institute in Australia was established in 1992, so we've had a National Institute now for uh, over 20 years. Uh, the functions of the Institute are there. I think some of the successes of the Institute, uh, one of the main successes, I think, has been a galvanising and harmonising of the forensic science community. Um, the forensic science community in Australia and New Zealand is a very different place to what it was 20 years ago. And it's largely due to the goodwill and the commitment uh, of the forensic science community to make the Institute work. It's made my job easy. Um, but we've been successful in introducing an accreditation program. We've been introduced uh, a, a certification program. We've worked with the forensic science community to develop a common methodology in most of the forensic disciplines uh, across Australia and New Zealand. We've developed really good working relationships with academia. Um, and we've also uh, been able to uh, generate some, some really positive uh, relationships and, and networks internationally. Um, this is not a mine is bigger than yours exercise. It's merely an exercise to show that uh, the size of Australia and the tyranny of distance uh, that's involved in Australia is similar to what you have in the United States, but our issues are that the vast majority of the population in Australia is around the eastern and southern coasts. We have vast tracts of, of, uh, of inland where there are very few people. Um, remote communities, but communities that have the right to expect the same sort of forensic services that the people in the urban areas do, and that causes us some problems, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, I now want to go on to talk about quality systems and, and what we're doing in terms of quality systems. I want to cover accreditation, certification, standards, validation and cognitive bias and they're um, <coughs> already issues that, uh, that my colleagues have, have covered this morning. In terms of accreditation, we established an accreditation program back in 1994. Um, at that point in time, it was a joint NATA, National Association of Testing Authorities, which is the accreditation body in Australia, 
a joint NATA ASC-led lab program. Uh, and we saw the benefits of joining a program that already had some runs on the board, uh, and that worked very well. It was done in partnership with uh, the senior managers of Australian New Zealand Forensic Laboratories, which is the Australian New Zealand uh, equivalent of ASCLAD. We had crime scene investigation in the, uh, in the program from day one. Um, we all thought uh, on the committee that crime scene in investigation is fundamental to forensic science, fundamental to what comes after it, and so why wouldn't it be included in an accreditation program? It's a one in all in program, so facilities have to be uh, accredited for all of the forensic disciplines that they offer. Um, it became a NATA only program in around 2000 with the introduction of 17025. Um, it's now a 17025 uh, program. And all providers bar one, <laughs> and we're having difficulties with the one, uh, are now accredited under, under that system. In terms of uh, certification, our program only extends to crime scene investigation, fingerprint identification and, and firearms examination, what we call the field sciences. Prerequisite for certification is completion of what is now a graduate certificate program. It's a three-year full-time or five-year part-time training program. People have to have that under their belt before they apply for certification. Certification is a uh, combination of written, practical and, and oral examinations. There's recertification every year based on successful completion of proficiency tests and sign off by supervisors and, and lab directors and then a more stringent points based assessment system uh, every fifth year. I agree with Andrew uh, who spoke previously. I'm, I've got an open mind on certification. Um, I think as, uh, as a community, forensic science needs to be thinking about um, becoming professional uh, body, similar to accountants, similar to um, pharmacists, where there is a self-regulation and, and a certification, um, and that may be the way to go in the future. In terms of standards, um, We've worked over the last two, three years to develop what we call a, a central spine or a core of standards which follows the forensic process. Uh, collection, analysis, interpretation and reporting. So there's a lot of generic information in those four core standards. Um, and we're now going on to develop the discipline specific standards, DNA, toxicology, crime scene fingerprints. Uh, which will bolt on to that central core but won't need to have all of the generic information that's already there as part of those forensic process standards. Those standards are now published um, by Standards Australia. Um, the, they've been incorporated into the NATA accreditation program along with ISO 17025 and the additional, additional criteria required for forensic science. And the first laboratories in Australia have already been accredited um, with that combination of, of uh, these standards and, and the ISO 17025 standards. We've heard a lot about validation already this morning. Um, we're working at the moment with uh, the Document Examination Specialist Advisory Group and our shoe and tyre impression people. Uh, to validate the, uh, the document examination methods and also the shoe and tire impression methods. Document examination continuing on from work previously done by Dr. Brian Found, whom I'm sure many of you know. We're also working closely with um, Drs. Richard Kemp and Christy Martier from the School of Psychology at the University of New South Wales. They've had some really significant input into rigorous kind of development of, of, the, of the validation studies and that, that's been very useful. We've, we've run two-day workshops for the, for the um, document people and, and similar workshops for the shoe impression people so they've got an understanding of what the, the, a rigorous validation program is all about. 
what we're wanting to come out of that is a common methodology and, and reporting scales right across Australia and New Zealand. They will be published for peer review. And we've got in mind, and we've already started talking about what will essentially be a generic validation model for disciplines where humans are the analytical instrument. I guess what we call the pattern matching sciences. Um, so we, we're starting down that track. In terms of uh, cognitive bias, I read uh, um, an interesting quote uh, recently. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which said, um, decades of psychological studies have made it clear that contextual bias is a fundamental part of human decision making rather than a moral failing. And I think we need to take that on board. Um, we need to recognise that, that cognitive bias is going to exist. We need to contextualise it in terms of, of the forensic science that we do. Um, in Australia, we've run national workshops in relation to cognitive bias. We've had people like Itchul Draw uh, from the UK to come out and, and assist with those workshops. We've had uh, a joint meeting of our specialist advisory groups, which are equivalent to the SWIGs and TWIGs in, in the USA. We brought them all together and, and had lectures about cognitive bias and ask them to have a look at the disciplines within their working groups to see where the, where the risk points are uh, for, for bias. Uh, and we're now working with our quality management group um, to, work, to work through those identified risk points and how we might mitigate um, those, those risks. Um, and that's, uh, that's ongoing work, obviously. I want to now go on to talk about uh, innovation, research and development. Um, we've had a look at this and, and we think there's, there's kind of three aspects or three categories um, to innovation. Um, there's technology adoption, which there's a validation and verification of new forensic techniques and instrumentation. Uh, and as forensic laboratories, we all must be involved in that. Um, that's part of the quality management process. There's then technology extension, which is taking new methods and technology from other industries and developing them for forensic science applications. And then obviously technology and knowledge creation, uh, Greenfield's development of new knowledge, technology and methods. Now I think as a forensic science community, we can do the first one on our own. But when we get to the second two, technology extension and technology and knowledge creation, that's where we have to engage with academia. Uh, we aren't able to do that uh, on our own. And we did a survey, uh, we, we surveyed all of the forensic labs in Australia and New Zealand and, and asked them what the roadblocks were uh, for them to engage in, in, uh, in research and development. And I guess they were, they were fairly obvious. Um, funding constraints, um, time constraints, difficulty in operationalising research outcomes, which comes back to a time thing largely. But then the lack of research expertise, and we've, we've already talked about, talked about that this morning, that there is not um, uh, sufficient research expertise within the forensic laboratories to do the sort of research in that, in that third category. Um, People are burdened with casework, they don't have time, they don't have the... The other thing we found, that there was not really a research culture um, within, within forensic science. In academia, yes, within the forensic science laboratories, no. So in terms of research and development strategy, there's an education component um, that I think needs to go with that so that we can build the expertise within the laboratories for research but also develop a research culture within, uh, within forensic science. In terms of way for, ways forward, um, obviously partnerships with academia, as I've mentioned, we, know, we need to understand how they work. They need to understand how we work. Um, my belief is that uh, a research program needs to be industry driven, but academically enabled. Um, so there's a, there's a partnership there that we need to develop. 
PhD, masters and honours level students, we need to be working with them as the, the hands and minds that'll help us with, with the research, leveraging funding that we, that we already have. One of the problems in Australia is that the funding bodies don't recognise forensic science in its own right. And so we have to play the game of kind of disguising topics, if you like, and, and fitting them into other categories so that we can, so that we can generate the funds. That's not good enough. And, and there's some work there to be done, I think, with the funding bodies to make sure that they recognise that forensic science is, uh, is a valid kind of uh, exercise where they should be providing funding. And I think the final thing is collaboration both international and multidisciplinary collaboration. There's no doubt that we in Australia and New Zealand can't do it on our own. Probably in the United States you can't do it on your own. And, and we've all got the same issues. We've all got the same problems. We're all looking for the same solutions. And so it makes sense for us to collaborate on those sorts of issues. We have developed a national research and development strategy. Um, but I have to say my institute uh, is again under review, uh, happens periodically, um, so we've had to park that uh, for, for the time being, but it, but it will emerge. And I want to go on and, and kind of address the, the issue about reinforcing, challenging and transforming some of our thinking, because I think it's really an important part of taking forensic science forward. Forensic science is expensive. I'm not talking about whether it's value for money, um, but it's expensive. And, and we've got to provide services at a time of shrinking budgets. Um, and we've got to be thinking about new business, and I think really importantly, new ways of doing business. Um, so we've got to think and do efficiency uh, and effectiveness. Um, what is effective forensic science? I think there's three streams uh, to effective forensic science. I think there's the investigative stream, uh, where we have the ability to influence the focus of an investigation. So early uh, elimination of suspects through DNA and fingerprints um, will, will help focus the investigation for the investigators, it means they're not going to the home of suspects knocking on the door, not going to the workplace of suspects, um, they can get on with the other part of, of the investigation once those early eliminations have been done. We've, we're starting to look very closely in Australia at, uh, at forensic intelligence. Um, Multi-case focus, uh, looking at things like crime disruption, crime prevention and reduced fear of crime. And I don't think forensic science is playing in that space at the moment. Um, two weeks after I go back to Australia, we have a meeting in Canberra where we're bringing together uh, investigators, crime analysts and forensic scientists to see what it is we can do about developing a national intelligence strategy. The thing with the first two streams is that you need the results quickly. And I'm talking about hours and days rather than weeks and months. So backlogs are the enemy of our investigative and intelligence streams. And because of the backlogs, we tend to default to the third stream, the single case focus, expert evidence, evidence of fact. Um, but I don't think that's enough. I think we've got to challenge our thinking about, are we just providing evidence for the courts or are we going to engage in these other two streams which I think are equally important? We've also got to get away from the siloed approach to forensic science. We've got to start building information by combining the, the, the data that we get from things like DNA, shoe impressions, fingerprints, any other disciplines you care to nominate. Bringing that information together, doing some analysis, doing some value add, and then sharing knowledge rather than just sharing the disparate, discipline-specific information that we tend to do, I think, anyway, um, at this point in time. The other question is, are we competitive? If you look at organised crime, it's flexible, it's nimble, it's efficient, it's innovative, 
it's collaborative, it's networked, and it's global. And the question is, are we? Um, I think we are, uh, to some extent. Um, but you've also got to think about whether there's an even playing field. We must have standards. We must have quality management frameworks. We must be developing the body of knowledge that was mentioned uh, in the NAS report. Organised crime doesn't have to do that. You can imagine Caillou, the crime boss, going to the door of the clandestine drug laboratory and saying, hey, Louis, are those amphetamines ready to be shipped today? And Louis's response coming back, not today, boss. We're developing our quality manuals. Not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. So we have to be competitive on a non-level playing field. And I think to be competitive, we got to become much more efficient and, and much more effective. In Australia recently, we conducted what we called the end-to-end -end project. Um, we looked at crime attendants, the forensic process really, from crime attendants uh, through to investigation. What the investigators do with a fingerprint link or a DNA link um, when, they, when they get it. All Australian jurisdictions were involved. We only looked at DNA and fingerprints, we only looked at burglary cases, but we got data from 8,000 cases overall. <clears throat> and it was interesting data. Um, if you look at the spread of data particularly, um, the, the jurisdictions uh, are listed down the right hand side, eight jurisdictions. Um, crime scene attendance rate varied between 45% and 85%. Fingerprint submissions from the crime scenes attended varied between 15% and 65%. And, and you can look right across the board at the spread of results, um, you know, to the other side where arrests from fingerprints varied between 20% and, and 60%. And so the question is why? Why is there such a difference between the results that the different jurisdictions are getting? Um, the, the, the collated results um, looked at arrests per 100 crime scene samples um, and, and, the, the, and the time it took to get the information. And where you wanted to end up was in the top right-hand quadrant. Um, but only one jurisdiction ended up there. They had kind of the, the most arrests per uh, crimes reported and they did it in the fastest time. And so the question is, what can we learn uh, what can we learn from that jurisdiction and other jurisdictions that, um, that, that kind of were producing good results? We're still assessing that, but some of the findings were um, you need to do 100% scene assessment rather than 100% scene attendance. And it seemed like the right amount of scene attendance was about 70%, unless you're going to engage in forensic intelligence. And then you need to be going to 100% because you need to be looking at things like modus operandi. Um, the, the successful de jurisdictions are engaging at at scene or rapid triage, um, getting the items looked at very quickly. Um, the successful jurisdictions have notebook computers that they take to the scene. They enter the data at the scene. They don't enter it again when they get back to the lab. Once only data entry. Crime scene uh, investigation rosters that reflect peak crime times. Most house burglaries are reported between 5.30 and 7.30 p.m. when people are returning home to work. That's not when you want your crime scene investigators going home. That's when you want them to start work because that's, that's when the cases are out there. Um, the successful jurisdictions have gone totally electronic, digital for fingerprint capture, submission and analysis. No lifts, no eyeglasses, um, total digital and, and their turnaround times for fingerprints are just amazing. Hours. Um, once only DNA testing for volume crime. Um, if you get a DNA sample and you don't get a result first time, don't test it again. Um, and, and follow the links. 
Some of the jurisdictions in Australia where investigators are getting DNA links and fingerprint links follow it up 30% of the time, 70% not followed up. Um, if you don't know what the follow-up rate is in your jurisdictions, I suggest you ask some questions because that came as a surprise. So we're doing all that work and, and uh, it's not being followed up. Um, about two years ago, I attended the European Academy meeting in, um, in uh, <coughs> The Hague and a young lady made this statement, take appropriate steps to prevent the collision between quality and efficiency. And it rang a bell to me because what we've found now having a you know accreditation program in Australia for the best part of 18 years is that what labs do is start off with you know a few layers on the on the truck, something goes wrong. So they put another layer on to make sure that doesn't happen again. And then something else goes wrong, so another layer goes on to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And you end up with a quality management manual that you can't jump over. It's burdensome for the, burdensome for the practitioners. It's burdensome for um, the, the assessors that come into the lab to do, to do the assessment. Um, and so what we're looking at in Australia at the moment is try and pare back some of those layers while still maintaining the integrity of the accreditation system. The thing about accreditation is that we must do what we say we do. So the more we say we do, the more we have to do, and, and, and that creates uh, inefficiencies. So the, I think the point is that we've got to get the balance right between the quality system and the value that it adds. Um, I think in Australia anyway, we're finding that we're no longer masters of the system. We're slaves to the system. And, and I'll, I'll back quality management day in, day out. Um, but it's got to be efficient. The other things where I think we're, we're in danger of having collisions is uh, increased sensitivity. And, and we've got to take a look at what our appetite is for risk and, and what our culture is in terms of forensic science services. If you get motion sickness, maybe you should look away now. But recently in Australia, we introduced new 21 loci DNA profiling systems. We introduced new genetic analyzers, and we've just introduced a new DNA mixture interpretation software. All at once, the DNA practitioners are describing it as the perfect storm, because all of these are more sensitive than their predecessors, and it's causing some problems. And not saying, you know, that we shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is, I think we're starting to play a long way out on the sensitivity branch. We're getting further and further away from the safety of the trunk of, of the tree. Um, sooner or later, and we, we may not be there yet, but I think we're getting close, that we are just trying too hard. And we've got to learn to say no to increased sensitivity if it's not serving, uh, not serving a purpose. So again, it's a matter, I think, of getting the balance right between sensitivity and, and the value add to, to forensic science. And the final one is, is, and this might seem incongruous to what I've just said, but I think we've got to have a look at what our risk appetite is. And, and quality management accreditation is essentially um, a, a risk uh, mitigation strategy. Um, but things that we're looking at in Australia at the moment, I've just spoken about forensic intelligence. We don't have a forensic intelligence culture. It's, it's kind of different. Um, and, and so we've got to educate people about that. I talked before about um, at scene triage. Uh, what's happening there is we have scientists going to the scene and, and instead of collecting the items, they, they doing the triage at the scene and, and what they're sending to the lab is robot-ready samples. And some of the people are saying, well, I don't know about that. Um, but it seems to be working. Um, fingerprint submissions, um, electronic capture submission and comparison. And some of our people are saying, got to take lifts, got to do the eyeglass. But, but the results uh, that they're getting in the jurisdictions where they are gone totally electronic, uh, as I've said before, just amazing. Um, and I think it's something that we, that we seriously have to look at. 
And so again, I think it's, it's about getting the balance right between our risk appetite, having a look at our culture in terms of going down the track of, of, of forensic intelligence, because I think to be as effective as we can, um, we really do need to be going down that path. I guess to finish, I just want to come back to uh, the, the diagram I put up before about organised crime being flexible, nimble, and, and, and whether we match those categories. Um, there's no doubt that we must continue to engage in quality systems in the broader sense. We must engage in research and development. We must engage in education and training. And we must engage and, and address all of the issues raised in the NAS report. But we must also engage in some thinking, some, some challenges, some transforming of our thinking in terms of how we do business, how we become more efficient, more effective at doing the business that we do, and how we introduce new business like investigative streams and, and intelligence streams. And I think unless we do that, we'll continue to suffer. And, and I think Andrew made the point before that, that, that Globally, forensic science has the same issues. Globally, we're looking for the same solutions. And globally, we should be getting together and, and determining what those solutions are. Um, if I may, I just want to add, finish with uh, two advertisements. Uh, one is for the Australian New Zealand Forensic Science Society. It has its next meeting coming up in Adelaide on the 31st of August to the 4th of September. These are now internationally um, renowned conferences and I send a, a very warm welcome uh, for you to come to Adelaide in September. And uh, also the World Forensic Festival, uh, International Association of Forensic Sciences meeting, the Asian Forensic Network meeting, which is on in Seoul, Korea, uh, October 13 to October 18. Professor He Sun Chung is here this week and her team will have a booth um, in the trade exhibit. If you want some inf more information, I'm sure they'll be delighted to help you. And finally, thank you very much for having me and for listening to me.